All right, so we'll call the select board meeting for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022 to order. We have David Phil, Jane Nevinsmith, Joyce Chunglo, John Waskevitz, and Amy Parsons here. And all votes will be taken via roll call. Uh, first order of business is the consent agenda. We have warrants AP2241S, AP2240V, AP2240, AP2240S, AP2241S, PR2221, PR2220. Uh, we don't have any minutes. We have uh, Hadley Police Department Dispatch, Romeo, appointment of Assistant Treasurer Mellis Balixilar, uh, one day liquor license request, top of the campus, April 30th, 2022 for spring football. Uh, disband the committee for agricultural area incentive committee, select board approval for mass DOT request for state highway access permits for the following events. Hadley Memorial Day Parade, Hadley Asparagus Festival, Amherst 4th of July fireworks. Class one auto dealer license, Kirby Corporation, DBA, amped up electric rides contingent upon receiving business certificate. I just have, I have a I'll, question about the mass DOT request. Okay. Can we'll we make a out. motion? Make a motion uh, first. Yeah, uh, sure. I'll make a motion to approve. All right. And we'll just, Second. We'll, just we'll just pull out the mass DOT. We'll talk about that separate. Um, and one other question about the parade. Is, is it on? It is. Okay. So, um, but any other discussion on that other than the mass DOT? All right. Roll call, Jennifer. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right, and so Mass DOT, Jane, you have a question? Yeah, what what are they asking for there? I, Mitch Cook is on here. He can answer that, David. If you can't, I'm sorry. No, he, he can jump in, but I believe we have to ask permission in order to use the roadway for events like the Memorial Day Parade, but Mitch can talk more. About oh, it that. looks like he's requesting, they're requesting rather than we're requesting the way it's written. Tanya Cook, you there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. So uh, the process in which we request permission from the state uh, for our for any town events that impact Route 9 require the event organizers to obtain a uh, an access permit from MassDOT. And in order for them to obtain the access permit, it requires for the select board, the chief of police, as well as the fire chief, um, to uh, basically state in writing that they're aware of the project and the setup and the planning. And uh, in past years for these events, uh, I've done these basically on an individual basis this year. I thought it best to consolidate them um, and put all three of these events uh, into uh, one singular request to use the select board. Thank you. Joyce, you had a question too? I, I just had about the, the parade itself. Um, we're going full force ahead with it. I haven't heard from the Legion. Have you heard from the Legion? Yeah, my I, understanding is it's on for the Sunday Memorial Day weekend. Um, I don't have times and, you know, for different cemeteries yet, but I think Jean Baxter is working with somebody new this year on the project. So She's working mm -hmm. with Denise Barstow, and I do have the time, so I can get oh, them out to you. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on the mass DOT topic? No. No. Just need a motion for that. I move to approve. Second. Okay, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. And uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to jump to uh, Greg if he's ready before comments because I know he's I think he's got somewhere to be. So Greg, do you want to talk real quick about uh, Park and Recreation Update 4.2 on the agenda? Uh, sure. I'm just going to catch up on some of the, the programs that we're just wrapping up and 
some things are getting started and, and we have moving forward. Um, we just finished youth basketball last month. We had, I guess last year there were 32 registrants. We had 86 this year. Um, a huge jump. <laughs> uh, I think uh, CYO not having a program helped us out a lot with, with our numbers. That was, so we had seven teams um, between first to, to the fifth, sixth grade. And then we had the group of, of pre-K and K. So like I said, we had about 86 kids registered through really eight teams. So really good participation. I thought that season went well. Um, we ended up doing a postseason kind of uh, pizza parties for everyone and all that stuff. So that stuff you want to keep as all had a good enough experience where you see why picks back up next year, then we can still maintain, maintain those numbers. Um, moving into the, the baseball season, we did some free baseball camps. Uh, we did a hitting clamp on one Saturday. Then the next Saturday we did hitting, did, did defensive play camps. We broke those up into age groups. We had uh, 76 registrants for the hitting camps and 70 registrants for the, the defensive play camps. So like I said, park and rec, we provided those free for the community. And we had a pretty good turnout for those. And I think those kids and families got a lot out of that. Uh, we also did free coaches clinics. We did two sets of free coaches clinics along with our coaches meetings for, for T-ball. Um, we've got 31 kids registered for T-ball. We plan on breaking those kids up into three different teams. Um, we've got uh, three different sponsors for those teams. Randy helped out getting those sponsors. So that was, that was nice. <laughs> um, so that's how we take care of some of the uniform costs and those things. But uh, it's going to be a good season. We've, I've got a lot planned for the, for the T-ball group. I mean, think of the past, they did one day a week and we're probably going to add extra um, optional days. They're going a couple days a week. And I've talked to um, Jim Ewan over at Sunderland. They've got some T-ball, so we might do some postseason games um, with outside communities. I think that'd be good for the kids. Well, we also did a a three-on-three tournament. Uh, We won sponsored that tournament. We ended up having five youth teams. So the youth bracket made, uh, we're working on getting the adult brackets as well, but we really didn't have enough teams registered for those. But we got pretty good feedback. We did have some teams register for that that do want to do that down the road. So I think next year we're going to do the, a spring tournament, but also do a winter tournament. And I think we should be able to fill both those up with the, with the feedback we got from, from what we did. Um, right now we're doing the, the April vacation program. So that started on Tuesday, started yesterday, and that goes – you know, 8.45 drop off to, to 5.15 pick up every day. We've got 20, 26 kids, I'm sorry, 25 kids registered for that. Um, some of them are for just one or two of the days. Um, some of them for the whole thing. Uh, we're averaging about 15, 16 kids per day right now. I think Friday, we've got some more kids showing up because we're going to do the pizza party and everything on Friday. Um, but that's that's been a pretty good experience for those guys. We're pretty much following the same format we did for the, for the February program we did. Uh, basketball and pickleball, uh, the regular season wrapped up on those um, end of the month, but we had enough people that want to keep it going. So we're extending basketball, the adult basketball and the adult pickleball. Uh, we moved both of those into Wednesday night so we can go back to back. And we've had some interest from guys talking about doing both. So I think that'll be good. And like I said, we've extended both those pro- uh, programs through May. Um, <laughs> uh, working a lot on the town on our website. So I, th- I think the website's looking good. We've worked on that and made that. I think it's very uh, user friendly for people to get in. I think we have program links. We've broken up by season and everything. So we're really working on making the, our, our online presence um, as, as, as the best we can. Um, with that, we've, we've worked on our, our distribution list and everything. Uh, I think what we had from MyRec, we had about 250 emails when we got started. I did an a email distribution list, kind of an ad through JotForm. And job forms, a program we're using, we used to use MyRec, but that was like $2,000 a year. Uh, we took that out and we started using job form and that's about $240 a year. Um, it's a little more work on my end, but I think it's, I honestly think it's more user friendly and it's easier for us to track our numbers through job form. Um, it allows us to, to customize things the way we want them. Um, but through job form, we've added about 70 some emails and just through other resources um, we've gotten our, dis- our, our distribution list up to 655 emails that we're working with. Um, we use that for our, like our, our newsletter we send out, the Parks and Rec Bulletin. That's pretty much been bi-monthly since we got started. Um, we did put out the third one, I want to say about a few weeks ago. And so it'll be a little bit before as, as we move into the summer before we put out the next Parks and Rec Bulletin. But like I said, we've got about 655 emails um, through that list. Um, with that too, we're working on social media quite a bit, uh, a bunch. We've been really trying to beef that up. 
Um, we hit a thousand followers or, or 9.99. It kind of it can fluctuate. We're at a thousand followers. <clears throat> Um, our post reach over the last month, uh, 9,902 reached, um, 2,600 um, actual engagement. We've had about 18 followers and likes in the, in the last 28 days. So those give us about one snapshots and never get into that. And so we're, we're continually working on social media and online presence just to, to get the website out there and just get as much knowledge out to our community on everything we're doing and, and increase participation. Um, Lots going on. <laughs> We're excited about getting getting T-ball going and, and helping out with baseball as much as we can and, and moving into the summer. Um, we're planning on doing a home run derby and, and, and really getting more momentum moving into the fall to, to beef up those numbers for, for soccer and for basketball again. So Great. That's kind of the, the update with Parks and Rec. <laughs> Sounds good. Nice update. Thank you. Thanks Great. for all you're doing. Thanks, Greg. Anybody have any questions for Greg? All right. Well, thanks for stopping by. Thanks, guys. I'm, uh, it's a learning process. So if there's ever any feedback or anything I can do, let me know because I want to I want to make our programs the best we can. Thank you. Um, all right. We'll go back to uh, public comments. 3.1 on the agenda. We'll limit this to 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes each so that everyone has a chance to speak. If anyone's here for public comments, turn on your camera and wave at us or raise the digital hand. And uh, Tony fight in the first hand I saw. Tony, go ahead. Hi. I am, um, I'm so disappointed to see the Climate Change Committee take the route of force mandates instead of education and persuasion. We all support a healthier environment, but banning plastic bags and straws will do more harm than good. Let's start at the beginning. The committee is calling for a ban on single-use plastic bags, but that's really not the truth, is it? I looked it up and more than 90% of people use plastic bags more than once. Isn't that what we're trying to get people to do, reuse and recycle? It seems absurd that the committee has tried to ban one of the most reused items that we have. While it's true that we can't throw the bags in our recycle bins, the local grocery stores are happy to recycle them for you. I called and checked. Why not encourage this, educate people instead of using force? And if plastic bags are banned, what's the alternative? Well, we could pay for paper bags. So we should cut down trees to help the environment. We can buy bags made of canvas or cloth. But these bags are expensive and they use a ton of energy to produce. In fact, you have to use a tote bag 131 times before it breaks even with plastic in terms of environmental impact. And that's if the plastic bag is actually single use. Each time the plastic bag is reused, the impact is re reduced 50%. On tote bags are also gross. Studies show that after using them for groceries, they are usually filled with bacteria, sometimes E. coli and salmonella, which make you very sick. Remember when COVID hit, health officials actually prohibited using tote bags for groceries. Banning plastic bags comes with a cost. Not only will people pay more at the grocery stores, they also have to buy trash liners and dog bags and do all the things to replace the bags they were or using. I don't know if the Climate Change Committee realizes this, but inflation is at an all-time high. People are struggling to pay for gas, groceries, rent, and everything. Food insecurity is a serious issue. So the Climate Committee decides it's a good time to essentially tax, put a tax on groceries. This is one of the most tone-deaf things I've ever heard. It's unconscionable to force people who are struggling to make ends, ends meet pay for your virtue signal. Plastic straws are not just a convenience for folks with disabilities and for senior citizens. You're gonna make it more difficult for the elderly and the disabled to go out and to live their lives normally. Or are you gonna force them to ask for a special accommodation, which is, which is just wrong. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you chose to use force instead of persuasion. More than two years now, we've had bureaucratic mandates jammed down our throats and most of them failed miserably. We had bureaucrats telling us how many people we could invite to our own homes and whether we could visit our sick parents and forcing us to wear dirty cloth on our faces. Now along comes the, comes the Climate Change Committee with more mandates. And we have to start saying no. We have to start saying no or it's just not gonna stop. And this is a good chance for us to say no. To the Climate Change Committee, I would say, what makes you think you care more about the environment than our, your friends and neighbors and have it? What makes you think you can't, we can't be trusted to make healthy decisions without being forced? What gives you the right to tell your friends and neighbors how, to, how, they, have to, how they can carry their into their homes, what kind of straw they could use. 
This proposal is arrogant and wrong in the facts. It will do more harm than good, including for the environment. The committee should educate and persuade, not force people to bend to its will. I hope the select board rejects this, and I urge the uh, Climate Change Committee to drop this effort. But just finally, the, all these statements I made here are verifiable. They're by research and data. And I went to the, I, went to the, uh, I read their proposal. There's no facts. There's no attempt to persuade. Now all it says is plastics are bad. Do what we say, obey. This is, this is, this is really wrong. I'm, I'm really disappointed. I know people on that committee. They're good people, but this is really uh, wrong headed. And I hope uh, that the select board in the town rejects it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tony. Okay, uh, we'll move on and we have a 615 appointment uh, for the ban. So a 4.1 on the agenda. I'm assuming Linda is gonna tell us all about that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Linda's out of the uh, finance committee oh, meeting yet. Right. You might okay. wanna give her a minute or right. a we'll, little while. We'll move on then in that case. Let, 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 Scott's here for, um, one thing I think so let's move to uh, 5.3 so you can get out of here appointment of interim chief wastewater operator uh, the select board will consider the appointment of Peter Clow uh, interim chief wastewater operator effective immediately and appoint Dennis Pipchinski as the temporary wastewater treatment plant operations advisor effective May 1st 2022 uh, Scott or Carolyn do you want to talk about that Go ahead, Scott. Good evening. Uh, at, at, as the retirement of Dennis came, uh, we needed to appoint a chief operator. And in the interim, we appointed Peter Clough as uh, interim chief operator until uh, we can go through all the, the motions with uh, making a permanent hire. Uh, and as you know, Dennis, uh, has been hired as a part-time uh, shift operator for the wastewater treatment plant. As, as a, not a regular employee, but an in, um, interim employee. Yes, interim employee, uh, up to 12 hours a week. And uh, basically we need Dennis, or the town needs another operator with a license, the uh, third uh, individual that is temporary working over there from the highway department does not have a license. He is going to be starting uh, training uh, next week, I believe, to obtain his license. So in the meantime, we need a another licensed operator, and that's a requirement from the DEP. Does Peter have all of his licenses, Scott? Yes, Peter. Peter's license was in training, but we applied for a waiver. Uh, that he was grant, granted his license in full to our site specific under uh, under that, you know, John is there, that's a full operator and Dennis as needed. So he is uh, in the eyes of the DEP uh, fully licensed. Okay. Don't want to get in trouble with those guys. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we are in full compliance of our, uh, discharge permit so we, we are in good shape with that okay thank you and i know this question is going to be asked but why not john and not just because he's sitting here but uh just so people are understanding why not <laughs> okay uh so first of all uh not that john is not qualified but in the eyes of the law in the state john is a sore commissioner and he cannot uh be chief operator and sewer commissioner. It's against the uh, their regulations. No, uh, when John I, J Scott. When I became a selectman nine years ago, it was uh, it, it's basically a conflict of interest thing. I I was elected in the position of the assistant chief operator, and I can't better myself from that position for for up to a year after. I'm out of politics, so that's that's why 
I'm not an option for you guys. Okay. I do I do hold a grade four license as part of uh, and Dennis as part of DEP regulations and Peter's the next one up with a license, but he's still an operator in training with a temporary uh, standard for our site specific, like Scott was saying. So. In, in Joyce, like I talked to you the other day at the town hall, mm -hmm. there's kind of two sides of the spectrum in this operation where you have the rules and regulations on one side and the office work in on the other side, we have the mechanics of it and the field work. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, and as I said to you, I, I feel Peter's very capable of handling the uh, reports to DEP, all the internal operations inside the building were experienced out in the field mm -hmm. and his knowledge and the time he's been there and what he knows, it's, it's incredible. Uh, so he is working with the temporary individual over there every day, taking him out on the road, showing him the, the pump stations, showing him the pipeline, how to make repairs and how to fix everything out in the field that, mm -hmm. you know, eventually we're going to lose when John retires. So uh, I'm very grateful that John is capable of doing that and training out in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. Dennis kind of worked with Peter at the plant, showing him that aspect of it. But obviously the field part is probably more important even. And John, like I said, very grateful that John is here and is able to work with these guys. He, yeah. he is available all the time for us. He, he comes, if it's not available, we call him for advice and he can walk somebody through. So I, I think moving forward, we're, we're going to be all right in this. I, I think we're going to come through and we're not going to have any trouble. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. I think, you know, John, you, you're a wealth of information on, on mechanics and how to take care of all of this equipment. So that's a real asset to, to the town. And, you know, you got, uh, you had two 40, you know, 38, 40 years of experience between Dennis and myself, you know, each. Yep. And, you know, the, the problem is, and I've told you before, we needed to plan for this a long time ago. Not, not when we need it right now, you know, yeah. I, I had mentioned in through school with the science classes, with the math classes, with with, with all, anything that's related to water and sewer to get these guys in there and start training them if there's anybody interested. And yep. they'll need to do it right now. I mean, you know, once I'm gone, you know, the, these guys are younger, but not that much younger, you know. The, the, you're going to need – you're going to need more employees for water and wastewater somewhere down the road here eventually, you know. Yep, I agree. All right, hey, David, I, I know Peter's here. I think he wanted to say something. Peter, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, outside at the, we, we go on our first one. Grateful, and I'm thankful for um, to next uh, chief position, interim position at. I, I'm in, uh, for this since I moved over uh, wastewater and and Dennis has jumped an awful lot and uh, new to uh, and not uh, by um, or uh, so I want to say thank you. The vote of confidence to see um, uh, my video. You're you're breaking up a little bit there, Peter. At least on my end. So. And too, but um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm outside. Okay. All right. Well, uh, appreciate you coming. That's that's. Definitely appreciated. Um, any questions for Peter, Scott, Carolyn on this before we vote? All right, Jennifer, roll call, please. Or can I get a motion, please? Make a motion to accept Peter.
off as the uh, chief operator of the sewer treatment plant. I'll second that. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Amy. Any other discussion? Jennifer, roll call. Roll call Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Uh, abstain. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. And um, Linda, I don't see Linda yet, so we'll keep on going. Uh, Scott, do you need to be here for the culverts for the ARPA or no? Uh, Carolyn asked me to uh, hang around for that. And if there's any question on the, uh, or something else to uh, the warrant items, I believe. So I, I, I'm all set, David. Just go. Uh, let's do 5.1 textile recycling program. If those, those uh, folks are here, anybody here for that? Yeah. Kathy Nelson. Nelson. Yeah. Kathy Nelson. I'm here. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So tell, tell us about the program. All right. Well, it's actually three, three things are happening. The state has added three, two items to the waistband list, which means like as of November of, of 1st of 2022, this will go into effect. Right now, mattresses and textiles, clothing, rugs, or cloth rugs, towels, sheets, all that kind of stuff people are throwing in the trash. I mean, some people take it to Salvation Army and whatever, but it's allowed to go in the trash and it's become a huge problem. So the state is banning those things from the trash as of November. So what we need to do, what they want us to do is put some textile collection boxes on town property. We need to put a couple at the transfer station and then they're suggesting we put them on other town property. Some towns are putting them at the schools, but I guess what I've heard through the grapevine is Annie McKenzie doesn't want that. So I'm suggesting we put two at the transfer station, two at the Russell School. There's like the little a little place where you can pull over and it wouldn't block traffic into the high school or anything. And then two up at the North Hadley um, fire substation. Um, Not our building the, anymore. What, I'm sorry. Oh, and it, this is free of charge. Um, right now, uh, Planet Aid has, and the Legion has three Planet Aid boxes in their parking lot. And according to what the Planet Aid salesperson I spoke to told me, they took in $4,400 last year from, from what was collected there. These, these people pay five cents a pound for the textiles they collect, and it doesn't cost the town anything to have the boxes. So it is a little revenue stream. But more importantly, we need to provide our residents with a way to recycle this stuff. So uh, there are three companies in our area, Planet Aid, Bay State Textiles, who operate in our area, I should say, and another company, CRMK. After researching all three, I think we should go with Bay State Textiles. They have a plus A rating with the Better Business Bureau. Uh, they're already coming to this area. They have a couple boxes. Um, at Amherst High School, UMass has a couple boxes, ton of boxes in Chicopee, Southampton, East Hampton, and Holyoke. And um, what else was I going to tell you about them? I just like them. Their boxes are, they're the only one whose boxes are labeled clothing, shoes, and linens. And if you're a rule follower like me, like the boxes that only say clothing, I would never put pillows and blankets in there because it just says clothing. So, and we want people to put all of those things in these textile collection boxes. Um, so anyway, they pay five cents a pound. Um, we'll receive money from them once a month and a tonnage report, which is important because I need to report that to Mass DEP. Um, and that's, that's about it on textiles. We just need to sign somebody up you know, get some textile boxes out there. The thing about mattresses, that's not really going to change for residents. People who have a sticker can still take their mattress to the transfer station as usual. People that are um, have, you know, a private subscription for their hauler 
I, I talked to USA and <clears throat> they don't pick up mattresses, but they have somebody they refer people to. How it's going to change is what the haulers do with the mattresses once they've collected them. So probably next year, the price will go up at our transfer station because it's going to be more expensive. They have to be transported now. The clean, the ones that are acceptable have to go to a recycling facility rather than just the, you know, wherever, wherever Patrick Kennedy takes the trash, only the contaminated mattresses can go there. So, you know, that's just like something we have to work out with him, <clears throat> make sure he's going to actually do it. Uh, fortunately, he already has a trailer at the transfer station. A lot of the transfer, um, transfer stations are all freaking out because they have to buy a storage container, which is one there, and they're not nicely lined up. So I haven't talked to him yet, but hopefully he he knows about this change and he's preparing for it. Um, so that's about it. So, so and and who who thought up the idea of putting the boxes up at the North Hadley Fire Station? Actually, Jane Nevin Smith came up with that idea. I'm not exactly sure that's a great place to be putting it where it's um, people going in and out of there. It's not really a secure area. I don't want it to be a dumping ground, as you can tell. For some of these, uh, when they get overflowed and they're not picked up, there's stuff all around. Um, well, one good thing about this company, what I like about them is they'll pick up once a week anything extra you know like some people they're just can't help themselves they leave strollers or whatever thinking they're being helpful i guess i don't know whatever's left on the outside they will take um and if if actual textile overflow if that happens very often then they'll call us and say you know you're overflowing every week we need to put another box there um so as far as that part is concerned it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a huge problem. So I, I have two issues with it, and I think it's great to recycle the clothing. But huh. one, one is, like Joyce mentioned, the drop boxes for Goodwill or whoever it is that are behind over by Starbucks there, they, they're constantly overflowing. There's stuff that people just dump around there. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure we want that in the center of town where it's, yeah. where it's visible. And the other issue is, like Joyce said, the North Hadley Station uh, generally our police officers and anybody else in town keeps a close eye on who's hanging out in that parking lot. And really there shouldn't be anybody in that parking lot unless they're there for business. So it, oh, it, definitely. it's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we want that sort of traffic in the parking lot. That, that's yeah. The well, one thing that's going to happen is, and you know, it may not act. I, I think we do need to have at least one box at the transfer station. Um, otherwise, yeah, yeah that's, that's great. I mean, it, that's town, where it should be. Yes. Right. The town is required, whatever our municipal, um, program for trash is, which in Hadley, it's the transfer station. We got to mm -hmm. put a box there as far as around town. I mean, one thing's going to happen is this regulation applies to everyone, not just municipalities, but haulers. So I, suspect what's going to happen is USA and all the various private haulers are going to have to offer it, you know to to their customers that they they can put their their textiles out for recycling um you know I'm not sure how that's going to work out it might take a while to get going or whatever but it may end up that we don't really need the boxes around town um I don't know how much people are already doing it. You know, I mean, we have Salvation Army right there. And then around the corner is Goodwill. Three boxes at the Legion. The Holy Redeemer Church has one also. Oh, do they? Yeah. And I know there's uh, two or a large Planet Aid box um, at Pulse Restaurant. Yeah. Clothing so, and the one at the church takes clothing, uh, bedding, shoes, anything of that nature. Yep. Do you, do you have to be a transfer station customer? I am assuming to drop textiles at the transfer station. Well, that's one thing, you know, at some point I wanted to talk with you guys about is that, um, you know, 
right now, yes, you have to be a full sticker holder. You know, maybe at some point we want to offer a reduced rate sticker to people who don't bring their regular trash and recycling there. But say you do have a, I mean, also Valley Recycling is in Northampton and you can go there for free. You can take any of this kind of stuff there for free. But you know, for somebody who wants to use free over a valley. Well, I mean, you have to pay per item, but you don't have to have to go. Yes. Yeah, you don't. Right. But you don't have to have a sticker to go there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right now, in order to get what, you know, go through that gate, you need a sticker. There's no, you know, reduced or or free thing for that. That was one, one of the thoughts about putting a box somewhere on town property for people who don't have the sticker so that they could use it. So is it possible to put a box at least there outside the fence where people, non sticker holders could use it. And that way, if people are turning it into a dumping ground, we can keep an eye on it and not have to worry about it at the center of town. I don't know. Well, one well, of the things about the North Hadley fire station is they have surveillance. And if somebody starts dumping, they're going to know who it is and can trace them right down and go after them. I don't now, think we should be, I don't think we should be having traffic going in and out of there. I, don't, I just don't feel that that's safe. And I think we should ask, uh, Chief Spank enable his opinion on that before we do anything. Well, I agree. So I, with I'm that. not. I'm not in favor of of that particular site right now. Yeah, I, I'd be for a couple at the dump because every one I've seen, the planet ones, the yellow planet ones, have been overflowing, and the snow plows smash all the stuff that's laying around them. It gets scattered all over where those boxes are. I've seen them in numerous places and numerous towns, and they're a mess all the time. Yeah, I've never <laughs> noticed the Planet Aid boxes being a mess, but I know there's a couple of um, education boxes over in the on the side of the Walmart parking lot. Yeah. And there's always, it's not overflow, it's stuff I'm, on people the shouldn't be the leaving private, there. I'm sorry? Property, I, I think, you know, they, they might work out if somebody's watching them. On public property... The DPW's tacked out enough as it is, and we don't need to be cleaning up trash. Okay. All right. It out, you know? Yeah. yeah. Either there's the Salvation yeah. Army, there's About the Goodwill that. in Northampton. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, David. Yep. I just wanted to comment on, John kind of touched on it. At, outside the landfill there, we do have dumping problems now, so I'm not sure if that's the best location, it's probably going to make the dumping problem worse. Okay. Right. I mean, at least at the transfer station, there's an attendant there. Yeah. So, and the trash is right there. So if people have stuff that really shouldn't go in the textile collection box anyway, you can just yeah. throw it away. I just say put a couple of boxes down there that would benefit us more. Okay. And, and maybe we can work it out with the transfer station people that since this is um, there, th this is generating revenue, then maybe they'll let people use those boxes if they're not a sticker holder, since they're just dropping off the textiles, it's not costing the transfer station money. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I mean, that's just something that, you know, I guess when you are working up a new contract with Patrick um, or, you know, I'll be happy to talk with them about it. I don't, I don't know who wants to talk with them about it. It might also, you know, if the boxes are placed there, but he is the one to do it rather than the town, then that extra revenue stream going to him might offset what it's going to cost him to transport mattresses to a recycling facility. So yeah, I don't know. It's like for you guys to figure out how you want to do that. But um, anyway, of the three ta uh, companies, I recommend Bay State. Um, and I can get, I I've already given uh, Jennifer the information. We've talked about this before. Okay. Um, Planet Aid, interestingly enough, Charity Watch, our uh, mass DEP advisor brought this to my attention. Char uh, Planet Aid, Charity Watch gave Planet Aid an F. Apparently they have a very sketchy um, bookkeeping system and mm -hmm. the Better Business Bureau gave them no accreditation whatsoever. So I just feel like yeah. 
even if they give good local service, I just did not feel right telling you guys, oh, let's use Planet A, you know. Yeah. And Bay State mm -hmm. Textiles is just pristine. They've been in business for like 40 something years and A plus with the business, Better Business Bureau, a ton of recommendation letters. And I just think we'll, we won't have any problems with them. All right. So do we need to vote on um, Bay State Textiles and at least starting at the transfer station to start with or, or you know, where? I'll, I'll make a motion to that effect to put a couple of boxes at the transfer station and then um, have Kathy set up something with textiles if that's. Um, who I think actually uh, Jennifer is the one that would do that, but okay, I mean, well, I'll, I will. Make a, I'll make a motion on your recommendation that this, okay. this, this happens. Uh, for the transfer station. I'll second. All right, so motion by Joyce, second by Jane. And any other discussion on this? Real call vote. Uh, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, Kathy, thank you for uh, coming. And, oh, you're very welcome. My pleasure. Okay. And uh, looks like, well, Amy's here. Is Linda here? Not quite. I'm here. Oh, oh there she is. Okay, so we're good. Let's go back to uh, 4.1 band. Oh, this, okay, the band. This will be quick. This is just a heads up that our annual borrowing is coming up. And I wanted to let you know that the ban that's coming due was for 787175 Of that, we're going to be able to pay down 310861 which is not quite half, but it's a good dent in uh, last year's, which is why we have the, um, this is, which is why we have added extra money in on the debt and interest so that we can begin so we can be getting rid of more of our prior borrowings um we thought we were going to have a lot more in additional borrowings going in but as it turns out we only have um about 567,000 in new a big difference of this i think was only a week or two ago that we were talking about the potential uh borrowing for the sewer and and uh, the Route 9 sewer and water lines, which alone would have been over a million. And it looks like the timing of the project and the timing of the bills, which is a month after the project begins, that we're going to be okay uh, not doing uh, borrowing in those areas during this year, which is great. That takes a million off the current borrowing, even though the um, interest rate is not that high. Interest rate is zero on the funds that you're not borrowing. And so it's really, it's always been. Um, and so, the amount of the total ban is going to be just over a million dollars. And the reason I want to give you the heads up is because we don't have the in-person meetings. When the ban, when the paperwork is done, it will be May 18th, I believe, is when we're selling the ban and the paperwork will be in within a few days after that. We'll need all of you to come in and sign it so that we can go on and wrap up the um, wrap up that borrowing. So you. if you're if you're planning to be away somewhere there at the end of May, uh, uh, get in touch with the uh, Jennifer or one of us so that we make sure that we've got three people who can sign uh, the borrowing. Sounds That's good. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Sure. And looks like um, Amy's here and do you want to hit the warrant while everyone's here from finance as well? Or are we waiting on more people from finance, Amy? Oh, uh, so I don't know. Nobody else will be, I don't believe anyone else is coming from finance. Okay. All right. So do you guys want to, why don't we do the warrant so that way you don't have to hang out through all the other stuff. Um, or did you, did you start the warrant? We just finished going through the warrant ourselves and we nope. just finished voting. We were waiting just in case you guys wanted to jump on and talk about anything that happened in finance. Um, or if you want to just give us a quick rundown of what you did in finance and wh where we are, that's okay too. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll just go through and tell you where we were with finance. We just finished, um, we went through article um, one through 16, um, and we just put our votes in. Pretty much everything was for the majority passed with just a couple things that we just, um, there was a couple 
um, items that uh, there was different feelings on, but everything uh, pretty much passed. Um, the actual, what you're interested in pretty much is the budget, where we are with that. Um, that is, is Linda has a, will probably be showing you all that um, budget. Um, I guess where we stood on that, the only thing that came up was just, it was a, the, but the main budget passed. It was a four uh, for it and then one, one against on some things and that would be me. So let me just tell you just in case you see an odd number there and what that means. Um, basically on the budget, the only thing I had concerns about was we have a budget that is about, we're using, um, we were using about 800,000 to balance it, right? We're upside down. So it was at 1.400 from free cash, 400 from the ARPA money. So what happened was we did come down by 50,000. So now we're uh, with the OPEB and we said, we'll push that OPEB and fund a lot of it, but we're going to it by 50,000. So we're going to maybe do it in the fall, um, just in case. Okay. So we pushed that off a little bit other than, so now it's three funding using 350 in free cash and 400 in ARPA money to balance the budget. My only suggestion was in, in my opinion was to on, um, on page 19 in your general budget book, it showed that we had, um, two things, um, two larger uh, new hires, um, big new hires, and that was the ambulance new hire and the police new hire. So that was about 80,000 for each of those. And, and it was just me thinking, I'd like, to, those are great new hires, but I was looking to push those off a little bit too, because um, union negotiations haven't happened yet. And that has had a lot of talk about being competitive in the marketplace where it looks like, and I think every industry is going through this right now with uh, salaries being low and we need to uh, look at adjusting our salaries. It's, it's been talked about quite a bit and losing people and, and need to take care of the people that we have. Um, so a lot of those are gonna be happening. That has not been addressed in this budget. The only thing in this budget really that you're seeing like for town hall people, um, for uh, the, the police, for the DPW, that's just the COLA. Um, pretty much is what we're seeing is, is the COLA, um, which is the 2.5% increase. The fire did have an increase um, as far as a promotion to help get them in a better spot on two of their people, which we uh, said that's, that looks great. So they are working towards that to, to, to boost those um, salaries. But other than that, um, we felt that it was a very good budget and I, we felt that the uh, um, were very responsible, all the departments, and they did an excellent job on presenting a budget to us. Um, we don't really have, I think there were very small increases, um, you know, such as the library had a small request for an increase on hours. Um, Council on Aging had a small request to replace chain. Um, for a part-time person, we had um, a small request from town hall for some extra hours. Those were, they were not any big positions. They were just a few added hours, pretty much, or a part-time thing. It wasn't anything big. So the only two uh, big things that we have going on were just um, those two new positions. But the budget looks good. And, um, and uh, right now, Linda has the budget for you to look at and just think that next year, um, you know, and, and going forward, you know, we got to look at uh, what we're using to balance it. You know, we don't want to, uh, you know, hopefully our income comes back. You know, it has been coming back. So it is stronger, stronger now. Um, so, um, but um, we won't be using that ARPA money down the road. Any yeah. questions? Uh, no. Uh, are we going over the, the warrant at all tonight or are we going to do that? We're going to have that meeting next week to, to iron that out. We, we, we can, we can go over it if you would like. Um, no. I, I, was in, okay. I think we should do it next week. I don't, you know, that That's wasn't right. on the agenda tonight, actually. 
Yeah, under uh, 6.1 warrant review. I just want to make sure that we didn't, um, I, I know we got the draft sent to us today, but what we need to do is set a meeting for next week, either Tuesday or Wednesday, to go over the, basically just a meeting for the warrant, to go over it, vote on it, and uh, sign and post it. And actually divvy up whatever we're going to do also. Right. So yeah. do, do you guys just want to do Wednesday at uh, the normal time, 6 o'clock? or That would be fine. Okay. No. I can't do Wednesday next week at six. How about, How about Tuesday? I Jane? could do seven. How okay. about Tuesday? Tuesday. Tuesday, I could do. I can't do Tuesday. I have four each meeting. Okay. How about uh, you want to kind of set aside Wednesdays because we keep kind of changing and being off and on? Yeah. You want to do seven o'clock? It's and called being flexible, Amy. <laughs> we if learned that in nursing. Anyway, you want I'll to try do that I'll again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do Wednesday at seven. Is that okay with uh, everybody else, yeah. John? Jane, you're good yeah. with that? Yeah, that? That sounds good. We'll make an exception for town meeting. Say that again? You'll make an exception for town meeting, he said. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, is that okay with Linda and Carol? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be there next week. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, actually, and if you know, if it's not, um, I'm actually going to be out for a few weeks. So, okay, all right. Well, then, we'll have to go on without you for that meeting. Well, I'll leave it easy, easy to set up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'd like to make um, one request. If you are going to, um, if there's something different from the budget part, um, and you request um, not to do something on the budget, or you're looking to do something else. The finance group has asked that um, we can, you know, um, meet again before the town meeting. Um, so far, they put it together exactly as the town administrator requested, and that's what went through. So unless it's something that you would like to not have through, um, finance would just like to weigh in on it again. So both finance and select board, but I don't really see us having any issues as far as the, the budget at this point, but just to be safe, if you guys want to be there, that's fine, but it's up, it's up to you. I think okay. we're just looking for numbers, Amy, in the bottom lines and go from there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Anything else on the warrant before we go on? All right. Let's go to, uh, uh, well, thank you, Amy, for coming. Um, let's go to uh, 5.2 ARPA set aside for culverts. Um, Carolyn and Scott will discuss several emergency culvert failures and the use of ARPA for funding. Yeah, I, Scott, I can kind of uh, give the little intro of what, what we've been experiencing last week and what the recommendation is, but you will, you'll have the more specifics. Um, last week we had two uh, culvert, what, what we've um, considered uh, failures that need to get addressed immediately. We have gotten approval from the state to move forward with that, uh, but we don't have is funding for those projects. And that is something we've been talking a lot about as far as directing some of that money, requesting to have some of that ARPA money um, directed towards some of the culverts that we have. And there, there are multiple ones that um, Scott has certainly pointed out to me and, and you know certainly uh, recognize that you can't do all of them but there are some more critical ones that um, would not be emergency, but we would like to move forward with allocating ARPA funds if the board approves and rec that those, we'd like to ask for approximately about $300,000 to set aside from the ARPA funds to help pay for some of those repairs. Um, Scott, maybe this is a good time for you to kind of pinpoint some of those areas that you, you're most concerned about. Okay, yeah. Uh so right now on Newton Lane, we have a pretty significant failure there uh, with some drainage. Uh, I'm working with uh, a local contractor to try to come up with a remedy to fix that. Uh, so that's in the process. And we've had a failure on Bay Road, the culverts between Middle Street and East Street. And uh, that one is in very bad condition uh it's actually developing sinkholes uh the one on east uh, the one on bay road rather uh and it also has the water main runs directly through the culvert 
So uh, next week, we're going to begin the process of uh, moving the water main, uh, on digging it up and moving it underneath the culvert so we can line the culvert. Uh, sleeve lining the culvert is going to be a lot cheaper than replacing it because the head are actually in really good condition. So as we just went through on nightly, we know head walls are uh, costly to build. So with this one, we're just going to be able to put a liner inside and they, they're going to fill it with grout to fill in any voids and there'll be a piece of plastic and there should uh, last the rest of our lives, I hope. Uh, but there's some other ones we're having trouble with. Uh, and I've, I've looked at them with a local contractor that we could possibly slip line them. Uh, there's one on South Maple Street, uh, one on Farm Lane, one on Sunrise, and one on East Street uh, that are in relatively uh, bad shape. So it's just just the tip of the iceberg with this. The, these are all around town. They're the same vintage, the same metal, and they are all rotten and they are all in really bad shape. Uh, I did find some uh, paperwork when going through some files and I, I gave it to Carolyn to look at. There was some uh, engineering back, I believe when Marla was here, uh, that they came in and did an assessment on them. And there is, there is some documentation of how bad these culverts really are and doesn't look like anything was ever brought forward with it. But as time goes on, they're just getting a lot worse. But didn't, didn't last year and within the last year and a half, a lot of those culverts were all dug out. I remember seeing the machine at many of the different culverts around town at different times, um, cleaning out those, all those culverts. So was this all brought to your, everybody's attention at that point um, that they were in bad shape or? Sure, sure. Well, Joyce, what had happened was they cleaned down both sides of the culverts. Yeah. The amount of rain we've had in the last year or so since we cleaned them out, washed the inside of the culverts out in a lot of situations where they exposed the rot on the bottom of the pipes because they were so full, they really couldn't be inspected at the time we were digging them. Uh -huh. So over a period of the last year or so, that's when – We've been, Scott's been going around and inspecting all of these and, and mm -hmm. finding out how bad they really are. Well, I remember them digging them all out within the last, like I said, year and a half and doing the cleanings of all the culverts that they could get to. Um, that was a big project there for a year's time, you know, when you had the machinery there at those. Yep. Yeah, Joyce, like John, John said, when we did that, yeah. we, it, it wasn't in the scope of work to clean the culvert itself. We cleaned on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And just with the natural increase of flow and everything, they, they kind of washed themselves out. And uh, now that uh, they're washed out, uh, you know, we get calls with sinkholes and things like that. And yep. when we go look at them and you can really see how bad they are. Uh, like I said, there was some of the ones that, are in the documentation that I gave to Carolyn, uh, they were inspected uh, by an engineering firm. I, I don't know what brought this study on or, or what the reasoning was, but there is some documentation, like I said, that uh, shows that the failure rate of the culverts there. I mean, there is some that are right, but I'd say the majority of them are not. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of them are pretty good size and, uh, Traffic flow is obviously a problem, like like Bay Road, very heavily traveled road. Yeah, uh, you know, just that's where sleeve lining comes in to affect too the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the traffic it's lot, impact. It's a lot cheaper than to replace the pipes. I understand that. Yeah, it, especially yeah. especially when the head walls are good. And mm -hmm. the only thing that stinks on this Bay Road one was that they literally cut a hole through the pipe and jam the water main through it so we cannot sleeve line it unless mm -hmm. we move the water main and that's going to be a project in itself uh so yeah. you know it, it, this isn't a uh, a cheap thing uh no. the ones no. that i looked at with the contractor 
they're around 30,000 or so. That's just for the materials and them doing their thing. That doesn't involve the little odds and ends stuff that goes along with it. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm think I'm thinking, you know, 40, 45,000 a piece, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. to, to do something. So, okay. But we have to, we have to definitely, uh, it's got to get done. The, the, the most impacted ones like, uh, South Maple street, another one where, uh, there's utilities that can be, uh, damaged and etc. you know, farm lane and sunrise. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not in the best of shape. Can they wait? We're going to definitely have to do our homework and decide, uh, which ones need the most attention and the fastest. Yeah. But Bay okay. Bay road right now is, uh, uh, in the motions along mm-hmm. with uh, Newton Lane. Okay. Sounds good. You need an approval or are we just going for it? This is just informational for us tonight. No, I would like a vote would be better to you to allocate those ARPA funds for 300,000 for culvert repair. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve that. Second. Any other discussion on culverts or ARPA funds? All right, Jennifer, roll call, please. Oh, is she there? Roll call, Phil. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> roll call, Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Liskevitz. Uh, I'll abstain. You got enough of votes. Okay, and Parsons. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. Let's go to 5.4 Russell School Committee and... Select board will create a Russell School Committee and discuss its mem- its makeup of its membership, um, and then we will uh, appoint that committee on May 18th. And so tonight, all I'd like to do is decide on uh, how many residents are going to be on that committee, who, what uh, departments are going to be on that committee, and we'll put the announcement out there like we typically do for you know a couple weeks. Um, you know, when the new board's sitting here on May 18th, they can make the decision of who's appointed to that committee. So who do we want on this committee? I imagine- Historical, a historical society. Yep. Conservation. Just, um, select board. Municipal building committee. Does uh, conservation need to be on there since it's not a really- a no, they, no, they don't. Yeah. No, cross them off. Okay. I got carried away there for a minute. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, municipal. Uh, uh, anybody from, well, Gary Berg's on municipal, so that would be DPW. Do we want the building inspector? He could if he would like to join us, yes. Yeah, sure. And somebody from maintenance. Well, Gary Berg's on the municipal said should be on it so they can choose we can have a couple of people from them on there if they choose to yeah, i think i see dan on here too tonight. i don't know if he's interested in it but. that would be appointed by and i mean and we could have some citizens we could have three three citizens maybe yeah sure three that sounds like a good number bill <laughs> uh, you probably want someone from planning board because of the allowed uses or the disallowed uses. Yep. That would be good. Yep. Okay. Planning board. All right. Diana Anybody? has her hand raised. Diana. Hi, everyone. This is Diana West. I am chairperson of the Historical Commission. I have at least two commission members who are interested in um, joining this committee. So we were hoping to have some representation there. We will definitely have one committee member. I don't know if we're going to be able to have everybody from every committee because otherwise this is going to be a massive undertaking to get people together. But you absolutely will have somebody from the historical on, on the committee. Thank you. Yep. Uh, David, if it's possible, can like Gary do a dual road, uh, represent the DPW as long as the building committee and that we don't need to be overly involved. I guess Gary handles that kind of stuff anyways. Yeah, sure. I know Dan, Dan Regish and um, um, Alan Weinberg are, are passionate about this too, so I'm sure they would love to represent the Municipal Building Committee and Gary can do DPW or, or however they want to figure it out. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. 
So, um, all right. So three members of the community, does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. All right. And so if anybody from the community would like to be on it, um, send an email to info at hadleyma.org. That goes to Jennifer and then she'll collect them all and send them to the select board. Don't, mm -hmm. don't call us individually. Email us individually. Uh, it, it all needs to go through Jennifer or it's not official. Okay. Hey, David, one more thing is uh, one of our reports that went out to the select board some time ago recommended that historical commission meet with CPA to gather consensus on what additional preservation projects could be undertaken until such time the building is repurposed. So definitely CPA should, someone from CPA should be on that committee as well. Okay. I see Carolyn writing. Carolyn, are you making a list? Because, all right, <laughs> just to be sure. All right, so we'll go ahead and put that out. Do we, we don't need to vote on this, I don't think. We just put it out there and then we'll appoint it on the 18th. That's fine. All right. Anything else? Right. On this? I'd just like to thank Select Board for, for putting this up front on. This is something that's, you know, visible to not just this town, but everybody from all the surrounding towns go by this building all the time. And we need to have something done with it. Um, yep. Time to stop kicking that can down the road. We keep that's right. pushing it up and it keeps getting pushed back. So thanks. Thanks again, Select Board members. <laughs> um, all right. So we'll move on to 5.5 uh, Ukrainian flag discussion. Jane Nevitsmith will discuss flying the Ukrainian flag in support of Ukraine. Jane? Yes, um, we took this off the agenda two weeks ago because we were busy and certainly could wait. Um, but because of the um, support in this town for the Ukrainian position and our roots for many of us to Poland and that neighborhood, there's a lot of concern that we support the Ukrainian people in their fight for freedom and democracy. And I think it would be a first has actually done all the paperwork and uh, the proclamation sorts of things that if we choose to do this, it would be easy enough for us to carry forth and make a proclamation. Okay, thoughts? I'm not actually in favor of, um, it's not that I'm not in support of the Ukraine people. I'm not in support of flying it on our town pole. We only have <coughs> two sets of whatever we can fly. And basically most federal and state buildings fly the American flag and not any other flag. We have two sets of clips that we fly, fly the American flag and the uh, town flag on our flagpole. If we, want to have a Ukrainian flag, I think it would, might be appropriate for us to put it on the uh, railing of town hall so that it is visible to people when they go by our town hall in support of uh, Ukraine. But I don't think it needs to be flown on our flagpole. Um, uh, and there are many other ways that um, people from around here, um, there's many ways to uh, show your support by many organizations for the Ukraine people. And I suggest that they um, take part in doing this, whether it be monetary or whatever. People are collecting money, they're collecting food, um, anything else that you see all around with WWLP. There's many uh, things, but that would be my suggestion is that we have it on our uh, railing at town hall so that people can see it as they go by also. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, flown from our our flagpole, um, but I, it is I, it is it is visible. Would that be? I I think that would be fine. I just yeah. think we need to have it visible and yeah. and say that we yeah, are one side or the other of the rails of the front staircase. Yeah, I think that would be a very appropriate for us to We've to do that. There before, and we got rid of that fence at Russell School, which carried mm -hmm. a lot of weight. You might say we've had a, had a lot of advertising and a lot of things hanging on that fence and we need to decide to put something up on that other corner there for a lot of these yeah. that, that so let's go i'm sorry put. i'm gonna be the jerk here and i come regardless of your personal opinions and regardless of your political stances municipal buildings and taxpayer funded areas 
have to be impartial regardless. And I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. You can't do anything political on town property. I'm sorry. And regardless of how I feel about it, this, I mean, this is other people's places of employment. I'm not saying that they do or don't disagree, but you can't have a political any way, shape or form on. Is, is there, a, is there, is, where did you pull that from Amy? Can you put your signs for select board? You can't do it. I'm sorry. You, well, you we can't have, have political statements on property. We have a town. political statement flying from our flag right now with the children's flag that went up two weeks ago. Ch children's advocacy. Yeah, that's a political statement. It's flying from our flagpole. And that was done with the state representatives being there with the DA actually right. was also there. So, I mean, I, I think we can. Uh, we let's let's look into it. Uh, let's get a ruling um, if that's um, okay. That's not Mitch, to say. Yeah. What does Mitch say? This is actually a subject matter that came up in an unrelated meeting from town council, and I think Joyce, you already said it about looking into it, but um, town council would have, would have something to say relative to a flag policy. Okay. Is that on a flagpole or anywhere? I think I, uh, I, I can't say specifically. Okay. Well, let's, let's uh, have, let's chime in. Could we make a phone call tomorrow, Carolyn? I can do that. Yes. Okay. If, and if, can I ask to go further? So, uh, if there is not an issue, mm -hmm. um, can you guys make a, like a, a, a vote that if there is no issue to move forward or do you want me to wait until next week? Yeah, I'll make a motion to to uh, hang it on the town hall if there's no issue. Uh, on the I'll railing. Second. On the railing. Yeah. yeah. I'll second that. Yeah. Motion by John and second by Jane. Any other discussion? No. And again, that's with uh, the attorney's approval. Okay. All right, uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Ingelo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? No. Thank you. And we have 6.2 plastic bag ban. And I thought I saw Bruce Brewer here and uh, Jack. So um, guys, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> I'll start off. Um, I'm representing the uh, Hadley Climate uh, Committee, and um, I just want to use this uh, this opportunity to review uh, what we're really calling as a um, end of plastic pollution or a plastic reduction. So, the eliminating uh, single use plastic bags is within the bylaws, but it's it's kind of a bigger issue than that. So. Before I uh, get into actually talking about the specifics of the bylaws, I thought I'd do um, an overview. And I first just wanna comment about the uh, efforts of the Climate Change Committee in general. Uh, <clears throat> this kind of speaks to the educational piece. Uh, this coming Saturday, for example, we have a, an all day climate day event at the Hadley Senior Center um, where we have speakers coming in. We're engaging um, teachers, students, uh, residents of Hadley um, to really uh, become more educational about uh, what we can do uh, within our homes, within our community to reduce uh, not only uh, plastic waste, but um, carbon footprints and all kinds of things. So uh, it's certainly education is uh, an important aspect of what we're doing. And these bylaws is just another tool in the toolbox of how we can make a change. So why are we uh, proposing these bylaws, the Climate Change Committee? And uh, to kind of simply put it, uh, there's just too much trash. Um, one of our committee members uh, mentioned that to me, and uh, it does resonate that there just is too much trash. And single-use plastic bags and throwaway styrofoam cups, plastic straws are a good part of that trash. And 
Nationwide, only 5.2% of the plastic bags ever get recycled. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts bans already glass, metal, and plastic containers uh, to go into our um, transfer station and in our um, uh, waste. And uh, the reason why plastic bags, uh, styrofoam, plastic straws aren't on this list is because uh, they're considered um, unsafe for the dual stream uh, recycling process, both single and dual because they are uh, what they call uh, tanglers. Uh, they just uh, uh, junk up the machinery. So that's why when you go to the Hadley transfer station, you're not gonna see a separate bin for uh, single use plastic bags or a separate bin for uh, plastic straws and um, styrofoam. So even though uh, the gentleman was correct, uh, you can go to uh, Stop and Shop or Big Y, for example, and bring back your uh, single use plastic bags to be recycled. Very few people do it. Um, again, only 5.2% of uh, single use plastic bags ever get recycled. And so where did they end up? They end up, they end up as litter. Um, the, uh, about a week and a half ago when we did uh, climate uh, or our trash pickup day here in Hadley, um, one of our uh, <clears throat> committee members uh, reported that uh, um, well over 100, 150 uh, single use plastic bags were part of that trash pickup. So that, that is uh, part of our litter here in Hadley. So, um, so we can't just uh, think it's happening in other towns, it's happening here as well. So again, uh, they end up in our uh, transfer station and they aren't getting uh, recycled. Um, as I mentioned the last time, uh, Plastic uh, takes hundreds uh, to a thousand years to ever break down. And when they do break down, uh, they break down into microplastics, which are very um, hazardous to uh, our environment and, and to human life. And even though uh, some of the alternatives to uh, plastic generate a large, <coughs> uh, excuse me, carbon footprint in terms of manufacturing, such as tote bags or paper bags, um, uh, plastic bags, uh, are worse for the environment because not only do they take millions of gallons of oil to produce, uh, they, they generate uh, microplastics, they never break down and they just end in our environment. So they're forever uh, with us. So <clears throat> um, sort of the best uh, way of thinking about this is uh, the best bag to use when, when it comes time to uh, check out bags is again, the bag that you already own. So um, we don't want you to go out and uh, necessarily um, buy new bags if you already have a bag. Uh, so even though uh, there's been some reports that uh, uh, these uh, cotton tote bags could get uh, dirty um, or they have germs, uh, none of that has uh, proven uh, to be a, a public uh, concern to the community at large. Um, and then uh, when it came to the pandemic, if there was a concern, as it happened in this state and other states, they just would uh, stop um, temporarily using um, uh, cotton tote bags uh, because of the concern about uh, the pandemic. So uh, in terms of um, food containers, um, when it comes to hot and cold cups, um, uh, when it comes to uh, foodware, the best uh, alternative is um, uh, plastic that can be uh, recycled or um, paper or cardboard containers that can be compostable or recycled. Uh, we don't want to use styrofoam. And in fact, um, I'd say many of the restaurants in Hadley and throughout the Pioneer Valley have already converted. Um, when I go out to restaurants myself um, and have anything that's uh, taken home, I rarely uh, <clears throat> see uh, styrofoam being used anymore. Uh, when it comes to uh, plastic straws, um, uh, in our bylaws, uh, though I have to make uh, one uh, slight change, um, we're trying to promote the use of compostable uh, straws. We're trying to encourage the practice that if you go in to get a drink, instead of automatically getting a, a straw, uh, we want you to ask for one. That would be uh, sort of the best practice. Um, <clears throat> if you really want a plastic straw, uh, a customer can ask for one. Uh, but uh, they won't be automatically distributed. So 
So that would be in, in the bylaws, and that's fairly similar to uh, the towns around us and what they're doing. Uh, what is the financial impact on the uh, restaurants and establishments? Um, <clears throat> all I can tell you is that um, the cost of uh, single-use plastic bags now, uh, there is a cost to that. Uh, I've seen one study that compares that expense uh, is already fairly close to uh, some of the alternative bags. Um, also, the uh, use of, uh, <clears throat> I lost my place. Um, the other thing about, uh, and that uh, cost, I'm sorry, of the plastic bag is already passed on to the customer and has not uh, really had a major impact to their business. Uh, just like uh, I know Big Y is not part of Amherst, uh, but they converted over to um, paper bags uh, a number of years ago. And I think their business is uh, doing as strong as uh, ever. Uh, our bylaws, if passed, would not take effect till January 1st. So that would allow a good uh, amount of time for uh, establishments to use up their inventory uh, and to seek out affordable and and uh, acceptable alternatives. So there would be that give uh, these establishments uh, some time. And then in our bylaws, if there is a hardship, um, an establishment can uh, uh, make their, their hardship uh, known to the town. Uh, they put it in writing and then the town uh, can make a ruling and uh, grant that uh, a waiver if, that, if there was a hardship. I know some of you are concerned about enforcement and uh, who in Hadley uh, town government is going to enforce these bylaws. And so I think we recognize that that is uh, a legitimate uh, and real concern. So I think um, as it stands now, what we would uh, like to see is that the uh, penalties and enforcement section of the bylaws stand. And if the town cannot enforce that part of the bylaws, then so be it, but it should still be there. Um, and, um, and I haven't seen anything in any other towns bylaws that I've looked at, and I've looked at quite a few where <clears throat> there is not a penalties and enforcement section in it, even uh, with some of the smaller towns. So in ending, um, I think these bylaws is just another tool in the toolbox. Um, we'll be joining dozens of other cities and towns throughout the state of Massachusetts. Um, as I mentioned uh, last time, there are a number of states that have passed statewide bans, and, and there's been a couple of countries that have uh, banned it throughout their nation. So with that, um, I'd like to end and then uh, just answer whatever specific questions you might have. Any questions for Bruce? Uh, I don't why, have a question. Why can't the companies choose to do that on their own accord? Say that again? Oh, why aren't we letting companies oh. choose to do that on their own accord? Um, sure. I think um, that's what has been going on, in, at least in our town and in, in a, actually throughout the different communities throughout the country. But I think um, as um, we're seeing, uh, more towns every year are joining the effort to uh, put um, something in place to reduce plastic uh, waste. And so I think this is just another tool. So I think education is important, which is what uh, I think uh, you're kind of suggesting, but I think uh, mm -hmm. this adds another uh, tool in the toolbox to sort of uh, help uh, push some of those uh, establishments that are reluctant uh, to uh, sort of take what I think is the right uh, step forward. What do you think is the right step forward? Well, the right step forward would be to uh, eliminate uh, single use plastics. So if you're in a restaurant, for example, and you're um, doing a, a large takeout business rather than using styrofoam uh, foodware, uh, that you would convert over to uh, mm -hmm. foodware that is uh, recyclable. So that would be an example of uh, taking a right uh, step. If you're uh, a grocery store or a large uh, retail business, instead of um, mm -hmm. using uh, single use plastic bags, uh, start uh, trying to um, use alternative bags. 
So to me, that would be the right step forward because we'd be uh, reducing uh, plastic and that would be eventually um, healthier for our uh, environment or our town if, uh, if we could reduce plastic waste. So I'd just like to add, just to back up what Bruce is saying, that the Mass DEP wants us to have a single use plastic ban. The, that RDP application that I do each year to get that grant money, it's two points if you have, if you have a single use plastic bag ban, which would give us the town $500. So it's not mandated yet, but it's coming. I mean, we just, we do, we have too much trash and we have too much plastic. Also the problem with styrofoam, when you put hot food into styrofoam, besides the recycling nightmare that it poses, styrene is released into the food, which is toxic for human beings. So it's very unhealthy to use as foodware, but furthermore, it's very difficult to recycle because it breaks up. So it, it ends up in the trash and then it's just more plastic that's gonna break that, you know, break into little pieces, but not decompose. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there that Mass DEP would love to see us have this ban. So is this about styrofoam now, or is it about single-use plastic bags? Because I hate out food I eat. But we haven't had styrofoam in many places for a long time. Well, right, because a lot of people are going ahead and getting rid of it because it's so bad. But it's And a lot still... of restaurants in town are franchises, and they have to order nationally mm, I don't think what that's... is yeah. required of them. They, get, they can't just use certain... Yeah. Yes, they can. <laughs> but no, I'm. I'm just saying, like, there's no, like, there's not styrofoam. So I'm asking, is this about styrofoam? Because that's what you were talking about, or is this yeah. about single-use plastic bags? Yeah, well, the, the bylaws are about um, single-use plastic bags, styrofoam, and uh, plastic straws. So, and, I just brought, so, oh, and I wanted to just share. And this is an anecdotal comment. I talked to a uh, chairman of the select board in Buckland because they had passed a similar uh, bylaw a few years back, and. Um, he said that uh, many of the restaurants, because that's where Sherbrooke, Shelburne Falls is, uh, many of the restaurants uh, told them that they were glad that the uh, bylaw went through because it gave them uh, sort of uh, an excuse with their customers to uh, go forward with uh, converting over. Um, so even though they wanted to do it, they thought they would get pressure from their uh, customers uh, not to do it. So. Uh, Anyhow, they were glad that the town uh, uh, implemented that bylaw. Yeah, Buck Buckland doesn't have any basically anything up there. <laughs> no, Shelburne Falls. They cover Shel part of Shelburne Falls has a few restaurants and the Bridge yeah. of Flowers and yeah. that nature. They should there, have but done that on their own, not hidden behind a town ban. Yeah, but I mean, like, I'm, I'm that talking just about silly to me. Yeah, you know. Uh, Caldor is in Northampton. I know there's a plastic ban in Northampton. And I want to tell you that the plastic bags over at Caldor is in Northampton. I mean, Caldor is, listen to me how far back I've gone. Walmart. Oh my God. I hate those bags. They're so ridiculously. <laughs> Walmart. Thick. Walmart is so thick. And well, they're, they're awful. And they're allowable though, but they're, they're reusable. All right. Yeah. They're and that's reusable. Why. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is, a lot of the ways that people are reusing them, for instance, where I live, you know, Winfield Estates, we have dumpsters here, dumpsters for the trash and dumpsters for single stream recycling. And people are putting their, they're recycling like crazy. It's wonderful, but they put it in a plastic bag, which the, you know, municipal recycling facility hates that because those plastic bags get all, we're not supposed to do that. We're, they're they're just but these but these are recyclable bags. They're the only ones that can be used over in Northampton, so they are recyclable. You you mean the thicker plastic bag? Yeah, yeah. yeah and those are recyclable. Those are yeah. usually a number five plastic. It's nice when stores will buy the ones that have a label inside with a little triangle and the number. Um, but those those are you can put those in your you know when it gets so shot that you don't want to use it anymore. You could put that in your recycling bin, but the single use thin ones, you can't. We could throw it in my dumpster, but who knows? You know, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, 
Yeah, that's what that's what people do. They throw it in the trash. Yeah, yeah you exactly. Gotta think about where the trash is going. It's going to an incinerator and being burnt. But but you're still but you're still using some form of plastic. So it's not really. I mean, the plastic bags they use over here at Walmart now are nothing, and I think they're compliable to what you're looking at. I Have you looked at the Walmart bags I have over in Hadley? Too. How um, much? Uh, how much plastic do they use? Since they're like eight times thicker and they're smaller, so you can't put as much stuff in them. So, are you yeah. talking about re like reusable bags with a woven handle, or the little? No, they bags? they just have a very thin um, type of plastic bag that they're using. That I'm assuming is That's what's allow what's allowable because it's not it's not well, that, of a thicker plastic that they used to have. I mean, you'd That's have to go and look at trying to it. ban are the sing any single use plastic is just being lazy. Actually, you know, like once you have your own reusable bags, it's so easy to be in the habit of using them. When they get dirty, you can wash them. It's just like owning a reusable water bottle instead of more and more and more single use. But bottles. I do, I do use these bags. I do reuse them yeah. all the time. But Even how is trash bags? No, no, I, I transport things like to work or whatever. Oh, or well, I, yeah, I mean, I do too. Yeah, We're I mean, they're, they're, the they problem, are reusable. The problem is they're yeah. ending up in the trash. Well, that's where you usually yeah. throw your trash, yeah. Does uh, Walmart in Northampton, do they charge for those bags? No. Okay. No. I think you're just talking about their regular single-use gray bags. Well, they have a thicker... Yeah, in Northampton, uh, they're oh, I see. Okay. They're, they're yeah, allowable they're in Northampton. They're reusable and they're a thicker plastic bag that you can use, reuse again. Yeah. Yeah. I think the uh, intention was for you to bring those bags back to Walmart and use them the next time you go shopping. <clears throat> yeah. Which, which is actually fine if people would eventually, when they're done with them, would stick them in the bin at the walmart or the grocery store where they actually would get recycled and reused but most people do not do that they just eventually when they're done with it they throw it in the trash i don't know i've got a bag of them in my in my room here that's low bags from northampton in case i need them because i like them because they're heavier so right they're, and I, I understand that the yeah. point is we all have to start thinking about what we're using what went into making it and what is going to happen to it when we're done with it? And, and, you know, and you got to think about what's, what Mr. Feidenkevich said also about um, paper bags, trees. Trees take paper bags to be made. There's a whole cycle oh, of, of things uh, that, you know, that we look at that we look at when we're trying to make things better, no matter which way you look at it. Right. Um, but I think so, it's wrong to take away someone's right to choose. If yeah. somebody says, do you want a bag for that? 90% of the time I say, no, I got two hands and I live a mile away. I don't need a bag, yeah. but you can't take away people's right to choose. And you can't force a company to do that. I don't believe in that at all. And the paper, well, right, so are you're not, you're not thinking about our trash problem. We, we well, have that's, a that's a, that's an individual problem. And you're taking away someone's right to choose how they take care of themselves. So if you make a ban, like you might be responsible. Absolutely. Bruce might be responsible. I'm responsible. Joyce is responsible, but taking away someone's right to decide how they handle their business. What about, what about people that, what about people that go down the street and flick their cigarette butts out the window? I, I don't think people should have the right to trash the planet. I don't yeah, think you should have the right to do that. They I don't, mean, but they, but that's, I know we're, that's, and that's why we want this ban is it's, it, I mean, most but then you're of, taking it away from people that use the bag four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty 10, 20 times. The, the kind of bag have a really, different bag that they can still use that number of times. We're not and taking away probably, all the bags. We're just taking and, away yeah. one kind. <laughs> I mean, we're using, uh, we're taking away the single use plastic bags that are less than I think 0.4 milliliters thick. Right. There's a definition in the bylaws, but um, those don't get reused. Except they don't. For, yeah, uh, they don't last. When you use they're it, the uh, ones, they're the ones you see blowing around stuck in trees. They're the ones that the committee on the 9th of May picked up, what, 130 large bags full of trash 
around town just blowing on the side of the road that people yeah, the ones are that irresponsible. You may be responsible, but most people, unfortunately, litter. So it, the thing is, we're, uh, hey. what we're working with are the people who aren't responsible. So if this, the thing is, once they're not given out at the store anymore, you won't even miss them. Because right there, there will be a U reusable bag that you can purchase for like a dollar. You know, and I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's an easy transition to make. And people that that makes them mad, too bad. <laughs> I mean, this is, they're ending up in our rivers and our oceans. Fish are eating them and dying. You know, they're just, they're a mess. I just don't think people should have the right to trash the place. Go ahead, Jim. This, this was supposed to be a presentation, and all this discussion should be a town meeting, not in our meeting here. Yeah. Here, here. Okay. Um, any questions about specifically what's in the um bylaw or the the warrant article while bruce is here anything that we need to address before it gets to town meeting and have this discussion at town meeting i do no. have uh i'm sorry there's a, a well hey, i was gonna say i do have one uh minor change to make in the section uh, addressing the straws so i don't know if i should share my screen with that or just just send it just yeah, send okay. it just send okay. it over because they'll have to to type it in in the right format so okay tony uh, biden up here okay T tony did you have just a quick question because oh no I, I just thought we should let miss nelson keep talking because i think if she keeps talking well this ban will never pass because that's that's exactly what i was talking about so All go right. ahead let her talk thank you we'll we'll have this discussion on town meeting um and we'll just we'll close this out for now um uh, Bruce, thanks for thanks for okay. coming, and uh, um, Jack as well. Um, all right, we'll keep going. And um, next, we have town administrator report. Carolyn, do you want to knock? Uh, you're muted. Okay. Um, all right. You're muted. Okay. I just want to let you know that the off, uh, Senator Comerford's office uh, is holding a. Uh, municipal leaders town hall <laughs> meeting that she wanted me to just share with you all. Um, that's on May 11th. It's Zoom. It begins at five. And it's just going to be giving an update of what her uh, team is doing and what lies ahead with the district. Um, just a reminder about uh, the dates. We have May 5th for town meeting and May 17th for elections. Um, and I, the last thing I wanted to share is um, just a, a real nice thing that Jessica Spanknable is doing um, in collaboration with the eighth grade civics class uh, at Hopkins. She's uh, hosting the day here where she's giving them tours and meeting with all the department heads and they get to ask a lot of questions. And we've gotten questions ahead of time that are really, really interesting coming from eighth graders. So um, I just wanted to um, thank Jessica for doing that. We need municipal leaders coming from that age group. <laughs> so that's that. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So all we have left is uh, executive session tonight. So if we have any announcements before we go to that. Yeah, the Hadley Mothers Club is having their recycling day on Saturday from 8 until 1 o'clock at the elementary school. So. Let put them all over this table. Do they take computers, John? Yes. There's a whole list, I believe, online on the Hadley Mothers Club West uh, website that tells you what, what they're accepting and what they're charging for fees to dispose of this stuff. Okay. Um, I'll remind people that the Hadley uh, Climate Change Committee is holding their first every, ever Hadley Climate Day this Saturday from 10 to four at the library and senior center. Okay. And uh, public forum for town meeting is the 28th. And we could, mm -hmm. is, is it possible to combine, combine that on Wednesday? Yeah, sure, that'd be great. It's your meeting and we're gonna go over the warrant? Yeah, that okay, okay. with everybody? Instead of a, two, two meetings about? Yeah, that'd be great. 
Let's just get it done. Okay. You know me. Get it done. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared to talk. <laughs> right. Oh, Carolyn. <laughs> I don't bite. <laughs> Any other announcements? I do. I, I neglected at the last meeting. I don't know where I went. I wasn't feeling well at that point. But anyway, um, I do have some announcements tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, send our condolences to several families tonight, um, to the family of uh, Barbara Zurich. Uh, we send our condolences from the select board to Priscilla Edmond. Uh, to her family, to Michael DeCola, um, sending our condolences to his family also. Uh, Margaret Kristofik, uh, condolences to her family. And Nancy Wysocki, uh, condolences from the select board um, to her family also. Okay. Um, so next we have uh, executive session, contract negotiations for the police union. The select board will enter into executive session as per the provisions of MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. If an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining position, oh, position of any public body and the chair so declares. Um, so if I could- David, um, could you let- uh, uh, Peter Lane, who's the representative for the auto dealers license, know that it's already been approved. Okay, thank you. That's all. I just didn't understand if the vote at the consent agenda meant that it was approved. Yep. I appreciate watching Hadley deliberate this evening, but uh, thank you. Okay. Yep. Thanks no, for joining us. <laughs> all right. Uh, Thanks so, so much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Just need a motion to enter into executive session, please. So moved. And a second. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. And uh, as chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive session. And that I state that discussing the matter in open session will have a detrimental effect or an adverse effect on the town of Hadley. And we will not reconvene in open session. So roll call, please. <clears throat> roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody else. Good night. <laughs>